Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. After a period of relative prosperity, declining crime, and a real boost in the city's spirits, New York is once again struggling. The mayor during most of that prior, more or less benign period was Michael Bloomberg. We're going to take a look back at his administration, the highs, the lows, and the in-betweens with Lynn Weikert, a retired associate professor from Baruch College and the author of a compelling new book titled Mayor Michael Bloomberg, The Limits of Power. Professor, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Um, this is actually uh, not a biography. It's, it's no. an in-depth analysis of the Bloomberg uh, years with a heavy emphasis on uh, policy, but also politics is, is involved. Um, during his three terms, terms, and it's packed with a, a lot of stuff. I mean, we've got a lot to cover, so. Um, and let's start off um, with something that I think people don't necessarily associate with Michael Bloomberg, and that is that um, early in his tenure, he was quite a healer in this town. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, Bloomberg is a fascinating, uh, was a fascinating mayor. He was really very able at the beginning of his administration, in many ways you could say that his first term was his best term. Uh, bringing people together. We were coming off of the Giuliani administration and Giuliani was a fairly hateful person and he he created a great deal of animosity uh, between him and and black people and that went away with Bloomberg. Bloomberg at first in his first term Bloomberg was very good at saying to um, saying to everyone that we have to do this together. 9-11 right. was a terrible disaster. Employment, unemployment is horrible and the jobs are escaping and we need to come together and all do this together. And he went to churches, he went to mosques, he went to black churches, white churches, um, he went to temples and he had the same message throughout and that is that New Yorkers can be united and we can do this together. Um, and it was very striking when he walked down the city hall steps and ran into Al Sharpton for the first time. He didn't ignore him the way Giuliani would have. He went up to Al Sharpton and said, hello, I'm pleased to meet you. And Al Sharpton said, come to my conference. And he said, I'd love to. And people said to him, uh, the newspapers, uh, reporters said to him, why would you do that? Why would you go? He said, why wouldn't I go? Of course I'm going to go. And, and that was his attitude. Um, particularly in his first, uh, his, his first term. And I remember being so um, surprised as a reporter, and not because uh, I had any preconceived notions about Bloomberg. It was just so unusual for a mayor in those days. We had um, racial and ethnic flashpoints all the time in, in mm -hmm. New York City, whether it was at Koch or David Dinkins or uh, Giuliani. Um, and Bloomberg came in with the attitude in public. He would, he would actually say things along the lines of when, when it looked like a flashpoint was going to occur. Mm -hmm. And he would say, no, no, we're not going to do that. Yes. Or we're not going to have that. He and did I, that. And I remember stepping back saying, right. what, is the mayor saying this? Does he mean it? Yes. And he did mean it when, when, the, when everyone started going ballistic about the fact that, that uh, there was going to be an is Islamic community center right. a few blocks from World Trade Center, ground zero, um, Bloomberg was the first elected official in the nation to come out and say, stop this. We're not going to have this. Any religious organization can build here. You cannot discriminate against Islamic people. That's right. nonsense, he said. They were terrorists. <clears throat> they weren't Islamic terrorists. They were terrorists. And he really um, believed that and convinced people of that. It was really a coming together. Now, he gets a lot of credit for that. Now, sometime later, he undermined yeah. this he healing aspect um, with his obsession with stop and frisk mm -hmm. when he was um, um, 
on his sort of crime fighting tear and he was he was very uh, successful the administration was successful in terms of bringing down crime mm -hmm. but stop and frisk was a disaster so talk a little bit about stop and frisk and about Bloomberg's approach beyond that right. to fighting crime it's interesting um, Bloomberg claimed to be very data driven and the New York Police Department had been set up to be data driven um, and the police were data driven in the sense that's what the uh, that's what their superiors were looking for they were looking for stats right and so it was a um, it was an opportunity and uh, to use this data and and he that was one of his issues I think was that he didn't understand to what extent it might that might be problematic and he also very much believed in his commissioners he supported his commissioners he would say to them constantly he would say to others constantly I support my people they go out there and they do good things and I will support them and so the fact that a particular police commissioner might have been going down the wrong road was something that he he would he wouldn't take in he would continue to support that person and that was in effect one of the the part of his management style that I think was really a big mistake. He never said to commissioners, stop. We, this isn't working. We have to look and try something different. And in this case, the commissioner was um, Ray Kelly, Ray Kelly, who was the, uh, the police commissioner, yeah. who was committed to uh, stop and frisk. Yes. And, um, and I, I, mean, there, I, I mean, I think that there were a lot of ironies. Um, it was proved after stop and frisk Frisk was ruled unconstitutional. Yes, crime continued to go go down even when the police yes. pulled back uh, from stop and frisk. Yes. And of course, Bloomberg subsequently, after he was mayor, ap apologized uh, for stop and frisk. He did apologize. I must say that that crime was going down around the nation about that time. Right. So sometimes we think things are happening in New York City because of a, a particular strategy when in effect it might have been something else. We don't know what it was, but we do know that it went down around the country. Right. And they weren't necessarily doing stop and frisk in other cities. So a another um, big issue that he grappled with, actually throughout his mayoralty, mm -hmm. uh, was education. Uh, yes, talk about his track record now. This is a big issue, I understand. We've only got a few <laughs> minutes, but talk about his track record on education. Well, I, Bloomberg never gets enough credit for what he did in education um, because he, he's so alienated. The, the sad part of his personality was that he managed to alienate people. On, <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and if he had been a better politician, he wouldn't have done it. But he, he managed not to listen when he could have had just more listening. Um, but what he was doing was trying to break down uh, the centralization. Unfortunately, he named Joel Klein, who was an antitrust litigator. And I think they ch he chose him because he wanted someone to take on the UFT in, in contract negotiations. Well, Klein had no background Klein in education. Klein has very little background in education. Right. But what Klein did do was went out and found some really good educators um, to be around him. And they're the ones that went out and said, let's let's decentralize this let's give schools and principals more authority and so and that was that was some of very exciting times he created many new schools small schools and i don't think we appreciate this day and age that kids need smaller school environments right. that they feel fairly alienated in these large schools and new york had some monumentally Monumental. large schools and they're hard it's hard to pull off yeah and so it's hard, it's also hard to find space for small schools in New York City. But to the extent that he did, um, he, he increased graduation rates, he increased um, test rates, he increased, it was, it was amazing that, that he was, he increased attendance. He was quite successful in those ways. Um, and every time he had that kind of um, success, the liberals who did not like him poo-pooed it, but but when you look back on it, but and partly that was because he he really loved charters, and he loved the charter schools, and that really divided uh, the commu the parent community, and there's so many parents who are against charters. But those um, those issues were complicated, and, and they're very complicated. And, and, and I agree with you. He had some successes there, but on some of the smaller schools. <clears throat> 
He put the smaller schools inside other schools yeah. where they competed for space yes. and then showered the smaller schools with resources right. and left other kids with fewer resources. Mm -hmm. And they played fast and loose um, with, the, with the way they graded uh, these, these tests and, and with the test scores and, and well, stuff well, like that. Well, I would suggest to I you mean, they, they, that they always did that. They, well, maybe they did, <laughs> um, but, you know, it takes some of the sheen off of um, the graduation rates and, and some other improvements when you find out um, that, the, that the bar was, right. so, to some extent, I, uh, I, lowered. I, My I, point is yeah. that uh, it was complicated. It wasn't, uh, he did do some yes. good things, and probably, you, you'd be a much better judge than I would be, probably the school system was better off post-Bloomberg than it was. Uh, well, your, your enrollment increased Parents, some parents who, who weren't complaining that they wasn't listening to them were far, far happier with their situation. They had smaller schools. Their yeah. students were doing well. Um, but I wouldn't take away from those statistics. I think those statistics are quite valuable. I remember one of the things he did that was great was that he, he linked high schools to co higher education. Mm -hmm. And he created career and training programs. And to those of you who are over 40, that means he created more vocational schools. And what he did is he wanted kids to get r real skills, real skills. And um, he went from like 12 career and training programs to like 42 or 46. It was a phenomenal. Right. And those are still going on and they're quite successful. What's so wonderful about, about Bloomberg was that, that he was very interested in young people and he showed that time and time again. And this is one of the ways he showed it. Um, I was going to talk about this later, but we might as well bring it up now. Um, Bloomberg's role in uh, promoting the technology sector uh, in New York City. What was so wonderful about that is he knew that we shouldn't be just focused on the financial sector. We should be focused on other sectors that made sense for New York City. And technology is one. We've got the technology already. We've got people here that are phenomenal with it. So why not build on that? And so outside of Silicon Valley and Boston, we're like the third sector now, the, the third place where you can come and get jobs in technology that are very good. And he linked that to the schools. So to high schools, to community colleges, and direct links into, into the technology sector. What was so wonderful about that was, I, it was really amazing, really. He, he went and created a huge new, University in, in Roosevelt Island. Right. Um, he made sure there was enough uh, funding for what went on with Columbia University and STEM, and he created another uh, place in uh, the Navy Yards in Brooklyn Tech. It was just phenomenal, one after another after another. He continually linked young people to higher education. That meant good jobs, and to him, good jobs means you don't have poverty. You don't have kids who are doing badly in school. You, you have people who are paying taxes. You have people who are happier and, and, and not, not as angry. <clears throat> the point to him is get people jobs. Another uh, stumbling block mm -hmm. uh, for, for Bloomberg was homelessness. But like the other issues, again, it's complicated because homelessness yeah. is linked to housing and he had a mixed record on housing. So talk a little bit about housing and homelessness. Homelessness, the increase in homelessness was the greatest increase in New York City um, since the Depression. Yeah. So it, it was an enormous problem. On the other hand, he did build some housing. So talk about that. Well, in some ways he very much failed in housing. And, um, but what's interesting about that is that 40% of our homeless come uh, from evictions. Well, if you want to stop evictions, then you have to change state law. Um, and we did. We changed it in 2019 during the de Blasio administration. Uh, before that, we, the Democrats didn't have enough control um, to, to make those changes in rent control and rent stabilization state laws. But once you made those changes, then evictions just plummeted. So before, before COVID, now we've got a whole new set of problems. But before COVID, um, if, we had, if we had been able to get the state to move, uh, we could have slowed the eviction rate. The other evictions were coming either from rent stabilization or they're coming from NYCHA. 
and he ignored Nietzsche. But Nietzsche actually, and this is the part that I think is real limiting in part of the mayor, mayor any mayor, Nietzsche, New York City Housing York City. Authority, that's really a federal, um, uh, a federal responsibility and even a state responsibility. But the federal government has been withdrawing money from NYCHA for right. years, and the uh, the state has withdrawn all dollars from NYCHA, so I'm leaving the city to uh, cope with the housing authority. Four hundred thousand people, over a hundred thousand units. It, it's just. Uh, mind-boggling, really, that the biggest landlord in the city of New York is the city of New York, and the city of New York has been left to its own devices to fix it. Well, I think one of the things that's not widely understood is whatever any mayor's record mm -hmm. has been on housing, it's essentially right. a federal responsibility for, right. for building um, uh, affordable housing, right. and they have abandoned that responsibility over the past several decades. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I, I must say, though, that, that sometimes he doesn't get credit for what he did do. Um, in terms of homelessness, before he came, it was a mess. Giuliani paid no attention to it whatsoever. So when he got there, he, he named a really, really a competent person to run the homeless services. And they immediately uh, started uh, on a strategy of housing first. It didn't matter if you were a drunk or on drugs. You get, housing is first. We're not going to deny you housing because you have a mental health problem. Housing is first. And that was really celebrated by everyone that we started off that way. Um, and I, I give them a lot of credit. And then they fixed the in, intake unit, which was a disaster. And it was much better. And then they, they made it all data driven in the sense that they finally got decent statistics so that they could hold nonprofits accountable for what they were doing with the homeless when the homeless were in their care. So there's a lot of good things that happened early on in his administration, but the problem was that he didn't have the funding that he needed. Um, when it came to homelessness, it, one of the ways we got people housing was through Section 8 vouchers, which is a federal voucher. Right. And the problem with the Section 8 vouchers is that we were running out of them because the federal government was cutting. Right. And so the, the the, the liberals blame Bloomberg for not having enough Section 8 uh, vouchers and for cutting them off. And Bloomberg said, I, I don't have the money. And, and I think that there was a lot to what Bloomberg was saying. And it's, um, it was extremely problematic. But where Bloomberg fell off, I, I, I fell short, I think, was, was not, not trying to deal with evictions fix the eviction problem and you won't have as many homeless. Right. He was quite good at dealing with crises and um, he took office just four months yes. after the catastrophe of September 11th. Mm -hmm. He also had to do with the blackout of 2004 which a lot of people have forgotten about yeah. and then of course he had the uh, terrible storm um, uh, Hurricane Sandy I guess. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how he dealt with crises. He's such a Bloomberg was a planner, and this is the advantage of having a mayor who's an engineer. Engineers are taught to be planners. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have the bridge fall down that you, that you design, so you have to plan it out very carefully. <laughs> right. And so he learned all of those things about planning, and he brought that to the mayoralty. And so he was very, is a very capable mayor when it came to, we've got this problem, how are we going to fix it? And then piece by piece, putting it all together and, and making it happen. And I think after 9-11, he had a $5 billion deficit. It wasn't a little bit. Right. It was a $5 billion deficit. Um, and, and it was very similar to, to 75 in terms of the, the, the depths of the problem. And he immediately said, we're not going to have 1975 fiscal crisis all over again. We're going to raise revenues and we're going to borrow money. Right. And borrowing money is Which a no-no. Right. It's At a big the time, no -no. forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> but Bloomberg had something that other mayors didn't have. He had a lot of credibility in the financial sector. He was one of them. And so he could go to them and convince them that this is the only way to do it. And he went out there and said, I'm, I want a 25% property tax increase because I cannot raise income tax. Right. Why can't he raise income tax? Because the state has control of all the taxes except property. 
the state, Pataki was running for governor. He didn't want any tax increase, so he wouldn't agree to it. So he said, well, I've got control of property tax. I'm going to do property tax. And everybody was angry at him for this. Right. After <clears throat> Pataki's election and after that year, which was miserable, and, and there was an 18 percent, 18 and a half percent property tax increase, uh, he went back to the state legislature in Pataki and said, I want an income tax increase. Um, basically, in his first term, he was taxing the rich. Right. He insisted on an income tax increase, and he got it. So he wasn't as conservative as you like to think he was, and he was also hemmed in by the state. I must say that Bloomberg said himself, there's one thing that surprised him, uh, two things that surprised him when he became mayor. One is how good uh, public servants were. Right. And the second is how little power he had because the state would always interfere and tell him, you can't do that, you can't do this. Which I've heard from every mayor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but, but which is yes. true. Uh, yes. You know, it is true. I mean, mayors' yes. hands to a great, I mean, they have tremendous power, right. but their hands to a great extent are, are tied. They're very tied. Yeah. And it was similar, I think, in affordable housing. And, and um, you have to remember that through the Giuliani administration, there was no building of affordable housing. Then Mayor Dinkins came in, who very much wanted to build housing, um, but he had a huge fiscal crisis and he was stuck. Right. So, so there was nothing in the pipeline. So when Bloomberg built 165,000 units of housing, that's a pretty big deal given the fact that he started from nothing. And there was lots in the pipeline when he left. So he left a surplus and he left a big pipeline of housing for the next mayor. Giuliani left him a deficit and, and left him no housing in the, in, the, in the pipeline. So I think that he had to cope with, with um, pieces that other mayors didn't have to cope with. Um, uh, disasters that were uh, um, more or less unforeseen, like the blackout in 2004 mm -hmm. and Hurricane uh, yeah. Sandy, um, how did he deal with those and, and where do you think, the, and, and I personally think that he dealt with them pr pretty well. Um, where do you think he got the resources or the background to deal uh, with that kind of crises? I think Those that, kinds of crises. well, I don't know anything about him personally. I try very hard just to look at it in terms of policy and, what's, and what the data says. But from what I understand, um, you're talking about someone who's very thoughtful and, uh, and, and a real planner. So he doesn't go into things lightly. He takes them very seriously and he thinks through what needs to happen. He also hired really good people. So that, that helps. I spent 20 years in government before I became a professor. And what helps in management is if you've got really good people around you. I mean, if you don't know how to do something, hire it. And, and he was really good at that. So I think that he had a core group of people that are around him that were very good. And I think he was very open to, what's the data say, how do we do this? I'm data driven, how do we do this? And um, he was absolutely determined. And one of the things he did was he always wanted feedback. So after the 2004 blackouts, he set up a task force to tell him all the things that they did wrong as well as right. <clears throat> he actually set them up to do that. <laughs> and they did. They wrote a report about these are all the things you did right, all the things you did wrong in the blackout. And so then he got criticized in the press for all the things he did wrong. So an ordinary politician wouldn't have done that. Right. But he did that after Operation, uh, he did that after Sandy as well, after Hurricane Sandy. So we only have about a, a minute left. Oh. Um, I know, you could talk forever. <laughs> um, from the time you started your research on this book and you did a tremendous amount of research until the time you completed it. Um, how did your view of Bloomberg change? Well, it was interesting because when Bloomberg was running for office, it was Green versus Bloomberg and I was a Green supporter and Mark Green supporter and um, I debated Mitchell Moss somewhere, I, some group, and Mitchell Moss was for Bloomberg and I was for Mark Green. Uh, Mark Green. 
and we were talking and very friendly debate. And afterwards, I thought to myself, maybe I'm supporting the wrong guy. <laughs> this guy sounds like he really knows what he's doing. And so I got interested in him. And, um, and I, and I had, was writing a book called Follow the Money, which is all about the way mayors spend their dollars. And I compared Bloomberg and, and um, Giuliani and Dinkins. And, um, and that was another place that I thought, oh, right. this guy's really putting the money where he, where he says he's going to put it. He's putting it in public health. He's putting it in the environment. He's putting it in education. And um, so that's when I decided I really have to look at this guy. So and you had a more favorable view than you started out with. Yes, definitely. I was very much against him at the bit. Who wanted a billionaire for a mayor? <laughs> it made no sense. Well, we have to stop there. <laughs> this has been delightful. I really appreciate it. We've been talking with Lynn Weichert. Um, and um, her book is, tell us the title. <laughs> mayor Mike Bloomberg, The Limits of Power. Thank you so much. <laughs> and to our viewers, thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.